a molecule of cocaine, 17 carbon atoms, one nitrogen, eight hydrogen, and four oxygen. At present, practically impossible to synthesize. In a laboratory test for purity, it crystallizes into a characteristic snowflake pattern, a rather innocent design. One ounce of pure cocaine can be extracted from seven or eight pounds of coca leaf, not cocoa leaf from which we get chocolate, but coca leaf from the coca shrub. There are two species of coca plants. One is grown mainly in Colombia and on the island of Java in Indonesia. The other is found on the lower slopes of the Andes Mountains in Bolivia and Peru, or in the jungles of the Amazon basin. This is about a kilo of cocaine, and which is the way it comes in in your larger seizures. This is the cocaine hydrochloride, and very often it's in, in chunks like this. In 1970, only four or five tons of cocaine was smuggled into the United States. By 1985, the figure had grown to over 100 tons. Well, my first experiences with it were very much that I, I got uncomfortable with it. Um, just because it was a stimulant, I suspect. Then I sort of began to like it because it, it made it easier to meet people I didn't know and feel comfortable in places that I really was unfamiliar with and wasn't comfortable. Um, later on, it became a way to not be lonely. Most headlines about cocaine tend to the sensational or the romantic. What we wish to do is examine the biochemical and physiologic mechanisms of cocaine study the reasons why compulsion can develop, and show how these processes affect addiction and recovery. The coca shrub was first introduced to Europe as a botanical oddity in the late 1500s. However, evidence of its use as a stimulant dates back 5,000 years to South America. Later, around 1,000 years ago, evidence shows that the Incan Indians, among others, chewed this light green leaf to pep them up, increase their endurance, dull their hunger, control altitude sickness, supplement their meager diet with extra vitamin B and C, and even make them feel good. They also discovered that mixing soda lime or ash with the chopped coca leaf would extract more of the active ingredients. This would allow the small blood vessels in the gums and the soft palate to absorb more of the cocaine. The next change in use came in 1860 when Dr. Albert Niemann in Germany isolated the active ingredient of the leaf the alkaloid cocaine, and began Western society's love-hate affair with the drug. Cotton swabs in your nose and have some medication on it to make it numb. Cocaine was discovered to be the only naturally occurring topical anesthetic. It is still used as a nasal or throat spray to deaden nerves when intubating patients. It is also used in some eye surgery, but it was the psychic effects that intrigued physicians of the 19th century. Dr. Sigmund Freud almost single-handedly popularized cocaine in Europe and America by praising the stimulant when writing about his self-experimentation and limited success in treating some patients for depression. Freud also popularized the intravenous method of cocaine use, where the powder is mixed in solution and injected directly into a vein. The easy solubility of cocaine made it a popular additive for all sorts of patent medicines, wines, and tonics in use at the turn of the century. Later, various cocaine prohibition laws made the drug scarce, so the illegal, limited supplies were snorted, not drunk. When snorted, the cocaine dissolves on the vessels lining the mucous membranes in the nasal passages. It takes a while for it to affect you. You know, at first, it go, when you put it in your nose, it starts, you can start feeling numbness in your nose, and you can feel like a little drip going down your throat. In the mid-70s, 
a couple of street chemists discovered a way to lower the melting point of cocaine through a simple chemical process so it could be efficiently heated, vaporized, and smoked. This process is called freebasing. And as soon as you release all that smoke, you get, um, it makes you feel like, like you're on top of the world, sort of. You know, it just makes you, mm. Most recently, smoking cocaine paste or pasta has become widespread, particularly in South America. When the local population only chewed the leaf, the concentration of active alkaloids was one or two percent cocaine. But with the paste, which is the first refinement of the leaf, it raises to anywhere from 40 to 80 percent. In addition, there are 18 other potent alkaloids along with kerosene and even leaded gasoline residues left over from the refinement process. But no matter which way the drug is taken, it is as a free floating molecule in the bloodstream that it will have its greatest effect. The speed of action depends on the way the drug is taken. The slowest method is drinking or oral ingestion. It takes about 20 minutes for the drug to reach the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord. If chewed and absorbed through the gums, or snorted and absorbed through the mucous membranes, the route is shorter. Onset of action, about three to five minutes. If injected, the action starts even faster. Vein, heart, lungs, heart, brain. It takes 15 to 30 seconds for the drug to reach the brain. The fastest route, about eight seconds, is smoking, either free base or paste. This is because the vaporized drug enters the arterial system directly in the lungs, then takes a short trip to the heart, and then directly to the brain. But before the cocaine reaches the central nervous system, it begins to affect the body. Cocaine constricts blood vessels, not only at the point of entry, the injection site, the mucous membranes, the gums, the lining of the stomach, but also throughout the circulatory system. This constriction can raise the blood pressure 20 to 30 points. Cocaine also stimulates the heart muscles as it passes through the coronary arteries and heart chambers. Usually with small amounts, you may just develop a fast heartbeat. If they're sensitive to the drug, or they're taking larger amounts, they can start to get extra heartbeats. Those who may be uh, extra sensitive, or if they're taking larger amounts, can develop a ventricular tachycardia, which is a very rapid, chaotic, but regular beating of the ventricle. As the drug continues to circulate, other organs will experience some change, but the greatest effects will occur as the coke passes through the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier protects the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord, from infusion with dangerous or unwanted substances. But strangely enough, psychoactive drugs such as cocaine, which can be toxic, will breach this defense. The target of the cocaine, the central nervous system, normally acts as a combination switchboard and computer, analyzing incoming messages from the peripheral nervous system, deciding on a response, then rerouting the information to the appropriate system, muscle or organ. The central nervous system uses a network of 100 billion nerve cells to perform these functions. And because none of these nerve cells touch each other directly, a combination of electrical and chemical signals is needed to get the message across. A message, an impulse, travels electrically to the minute junction between nerve cells called a synapse. There, it causes tiny bits of chemicals, 
neurotransmitters to be spit out across the gap. These neurotransmitters then slot into receptor sites on the adjacent cell, triggering an electrical relay of the signal to the next synapse where the process is repeated. The neurotransmitters which have returned to the holding sacs fire again. The signal is triggered up to 200 times a second. It is at this microscopic level that cocaine will have its greatest effect because if you disrupt the chemistry of the nervous system, you will then distort many of the messages being sent to the body, heart, lung, muscles, and particularly to the brain. Fear is one of the messages particularly susceptible to manipulation when cocaine is involved. Another concerns flight, such as athletic performance. Some of the messages are about love and passion. And others are about fighting, conflict. In each of these cases, the body's reaction to the call for extra energy, extra action, extra passion, is to release extra neurotransmitters in certain parts of the brain in order to prepare the body to react swiftly to the danger or pleasure at hand. The initial shock is almost too much, but it's when you start feeling the adrenaline working for you, it's, um, it turns the whole thing around. This heightening of the senses is a natural reaction, a natural rush, a natural high. Keep your head up, Al. Keep that head up. That's where Extra up energy up. needed, extra on. energy up, given. Al. Danger or excitement passed, neurotransmitters reabsorbed or neutralized. However, when cocaine is taken, the molecules of the drug force the release of the neurotransmitters without a call to action by the brain. In addition, the cocaine blocks the intake ports of the transmitting nerve cell, so the energy chemicals cannot be reabsorbed when they return across the synaptic gap. And so they stay free longer and exaggerate the extra energy signal. Suddenly, there's all this unneeded extra energy. So we become busier, more energetic, more restless, more excited. We become more sensitive to any stimulus. Everything becomes exaggerated. Initially, it exaggerated um, excitement or happiness. I mean, I've heard people use the word euphoria, and it exaggerated everything, and it seemed positive initially. As it became negative, it became extremely negative. And even when I wasn't actually doing the cocaine, just coming down from it, everything seemed extremely out of proportion to everything else. The cocaine fools us. It tells our body that we need energy when we don't. It exaggerates the reality of our senses. It also fools us in other ways. My mind um, had a great deal of pleasure. Um, I felt like a somebody. I felt like I, a, a super person. I could do anything. The kind of feeling when you get, when you inject it, you get like, it's sort of like the feeling after you, when you're making love with your, with your wife, to, you know, the, when you climax. The cocaine has conned the body again. It told the brain that something pleasurable had occurred when it hadn't. Normally, this reward mechanism is part of our body's system for survival. It tells us when we're doing the right thing. For example, if we need food and then eat to satisfy that hunger, our hunger center is stimulated. It tells us we're full, we feel satisfied. If we're thirsty and we drink some water, our thirst center is stimulated. It tells us we've quenched that thirst. If we have sex, it rewards us by stimulating our pleasure center, saying, ah, this is good. What cocaine does is reward us chemically. It makes our brain tell us we've had food, though we're still hungry, that we've drunk some liquid, though we're still thirsty, that we've had sex, though we're still unsatisfied. When I was smoking Freebase, the only thing I noticed 
was the effects of the dehydration, like my lips cracking and my tongue swelling up. And then I knew I needed liquids, but I didn't feel the need for it. So these are two crucial ways cocaine can affect us. First, by giving extra energy to the body when it's not needed, and second, by rewarding us for things we have not done. However, it is important to remember that we are all absolutely unique, just like everybody else. So each person's reaction to an identical dose of a drug is also unique. It depends on how tired we are, our health, our weight, our mood, our heredity, our surroundings, the time of day, and on and on. So the effects we've described so far are for an average person of average disposition on an average day taking an average dose. But what happens if an average person takes cocaine for a longer period of time or takes a larger dose? What happens then to the extra energy and the euphoria from stimulation of the reward and pleasure centers? Normally, there is a limit to the amount of reserve energy available within the body. When that limit is reached, when too much of an effort has been called forth, the body collapses, saying, hold on, give me a chance to recover. Remember, the extra energy is not a free, no strings attached gift. It is a loan from the rest of the body and must be paid back. Prolonged use or high dose use of cocaine will cause the same exhaustion, but it will do it chemically, not naturally. It will eventually wring almost every last drop of energy chemicals from our nerve cells. Also, there is no natural built-in regulator governing our use of cocaine. If our nose didn't become irritated and the vessels close up, we could snort several grams a day. In fact, there is a compulsive quality about cocaine that can cause us to snort, smoke, or shoot it till we collapse. Yeah, I had physical depression to the point where I wouldn't get out of bed. I mean, I, I just didn't get out of bed. I had signals, you know, I wouldn't, I would mean to get up and not. Suddenly, instead of it being 10 o'clock, it'd be 3 in the afternoon, I'm still not out of bed. That's what happens to our energy supplies if we continue to take cocaine. But what happens to our reward and pleasure centers? If we continue to stimulate our hunger centers and it tells us we are full, we will lose large amounts of weight and run into nutrition problems. I weighed 85 pounds. Um, I was anemic. I didn't sleep well. Um, and my self-esteem was about zip. After a while, when you keep doing it, um, it's just like, you know, you, you're impotent and you, you can't, you know, it, it doesn't have no effect. Uh, um, the opposite sex can do anything they want to you and you won't react. You know, your body doesn't react to it, to any kind of, uh, you know, touch, emotion, or, you know. Neurotransmitters must be in balance for the body to function normally. If one becomes depleted, the others become unbalanced. For example, one of the neurotransmitters released by cocaine is dopamine. Unbalanced dopamine in the system can cause a person to become overly suspicious, even paranoid, and delusional. This comes from overstimulation of our brain's fright center. The person I know uh, does a shot every 15 to 20 minutes every day. He fights sleep. He'll go three days without sleeping and he'll collapse. He looks for people hiding under mattresses, behind door hinges, and books, and asks you why you're smiling, why your foot is moving. Normally, acetylcholine increases muscular coordination and mental acuity. But in excess, it causes muscle tremors, involuntary muscle reflexes, and memory lapses and when finally depleted, mental confusion and even hallucinations are the result. It exaggerated my perceptions of everything. 
to the extent that I no longer had any clear picture of what was actually going on. And the fear of that complete inability to really have any awareness of what was actually happening and having to live in a world where I could only feel what seemed to be happening was, uh, was the most horrifying thing I ever have experienced. Normally, serotonin helps us sleep and keeps us from being depressed. But as we use cocaine over a longer period, the serotonin becomes depleted, causing insomnia, agitation, and severe emotional depression. I really did want to die, and that I remember as being way out of proportion to the actual events in my life. It wasn't like I was, uh, I really had that big of a problem, although it seemed that my life was over. How long it takes the body to return to normal after using cocaine depends on a number of factors, including length of use, state of health, and heredity. Cocaine is metabolized by almost every body fluid and every body tissue uh, in, in the human system, in the blood, in the liver, in uh, brain cells, everywhere where this enzyme exists, it's rapidly breaking down cocaine such that the length of time that it lasts and has major effects in your body is only about 40 minutes. But the disruption of the chemical balance can cause the physical exhaustion and mental depression to persist for days, weeks, even months. It was like a complete depletion of all body chemicals, vitamins, um, uh, lack of sleep, but I couldn't get my sleep. After coming down, maybe, I don't remember until I stopped using coke entirely, about a, a month later, I finally started sleeping. Since cocaine is a stimulant, taking too much can cause another problem, overdosing. An overdose of cocaine can be as little as a 50th of a gram or as much as 1.2 grams, depending on the sensitivity of the user. Well, there was a, a heavy beating a, a tachycardia, um, a sense of not being able to get my breath, um, of th the sensation of moving, everything moving very quickly and very intensely. An overdose can cause gasping, irregular breathing, and even respiratory collapse. An overdose can cause convulsions, lightheadedness, delirium, uncontrolled muscle spasms, and fainting. The heart is not pumping out adequate amounts of blood, and these people can become hypotensive, have low blood pressures. If this is not corrected, uh, individuals can then develop what we call ventricular fibrillation. If that's not corrected, then the heart will totally stop with no beating, whatever. The strange thing about cocaine is that a person could take the same small dose once a day or even once a week, getting only a mild rush, and then suddenly one day he has a real rush. It's a sensitization process that occurs in the brain's neural pathways. It's like remembering a phone number. The more we dial, the easier it is to remember the next time. And so, the long-term cocaine user's mind remembers the path the coke took and speeds the stimulatory message on its way. There are other problems that occur with the long-term use of cocaine. One is infection from contaminants when using the drug intravenously. Damaging microbial infections, such as endocarditis, and blood infections, such as septicemia or hepatitis, are common. Further, there is an increasing incidence of AIDS cases, spread by dirty coke needles. Another danger is tissue that dies or becomes gangrenous because of severely restricted blood flow caused by cocaine's ability to constrict veins and arteries. This occurs most often at injection sites or in the nose. Notice the hole in the nasal septum from dissolved cartilage. Adulteration is a problem with any drug bought from a street dealer. With cocaine, diluents such as manite, a baby laxative, aspirin, and even sugar have been used. In this sample, we have a moderate amount of cocaine, and we also have uh, benzocaine, caffeine, lidocaine, procaine, the cocaine, tetracaine, and some heroin. 
The other diluent that causes problems is amphetamines, or speed, a synthetic stimulant similar to cocaine. Amphetamines will last a much longer period of time in the body and stimulate you for a much greater length of time, but not give you the same degree of stimulation and the same euphoria that cocaine does. Although cocaine and amphetamines are both very euphoric, uh, remember cocaine is only a 40-minute duration of action, whereas amphetamines would be a four to six hour duration of action. Money is one of the biggest problems. With the cost of a gram hovering around $100, many users have gone through their savings, their businesses, even their homes. They used to say that, uh, tell me that I was going down the tubes behind it, that I'd become a thief, which I had behind cocaine, which I never was before. Really, I was maybe dishonest in my feelings, but uh, materially, I got into a lot of, um, you know, thievery where as I meant to pay you back and when I was doing it it wasn't like I was stealing from you because I was gonna pay you back finally there's the problem of poly drug use using more than one drug with cocaine in particular the stimulation can be so intense that a downer such as Valium Secanol heroin or alcohol is needed to take the edge off the high or just to get the user to sleep the other drugs can be as much or more of a problem than the cocaine itself. When I couldn't get Valium, um, alcohol became the easy choice. In fact, I remember a doctor one time telling me that I should stop taking Valium, and I said, but I needed to go to sleep. And the doctor said, well, why don't you just replace it with a, a good brandy? That would do it. So after all the coke is gone, I do the heroin and it'd bring me down, and I wouldn't be all, all jittery all night and grinding my teeth and you know, I would, it would bring my, my adrenaline down. Several questions come to mind. First, with all these potential problems, why do people use cocaine? And second, why do some use it so compulsively? As to the question, why do they use it? The answer has to be in the fact that cocaine mimics natural body functions, the euphoria, the confidence, the adrenal energy rush, the increased sensitivity are all natural highs for a human being, and cocaine can mimic those feelings. When you're off the field and you have played before 70,000 people and you come off and now you're in life and you back down the normal, so to speak, you want to get back up there. And so cocaine, what it does, it replaces that natural high with an artificial stimulation that gives you the high. Now, to come down from cocaine is very, very draining, both emotionally, both physically, both nutritionally. And it's totally different than coming down from the natural high. Another reason for cocaine's popularity is its social acceptability. I began to feel a little bit like I ought to do the cocaine just because they all did it, and that's what you did when you were in New York, and that's what it felt like initially for me. Um, and I didn't really like the cocaine at first. I mean, I, I was a little intimidated by it. I'd never even smoked a joint prior to that time. As to the second question, why is it used so compulsively, the answer is more complicated. I think uh, it, it's the, once you really get the first rush from it, you know, no other one is like that one. And so you continue to chase that. You know, you continue to chase that one feeling that you got the first time, and so you, I think, for me, that's what it was, is to, we used to say you're chasing a little green man, you know. Another reason has to do with the sensitization effect. We've ingrained our memory with the sensations of using Coke. And they see white resin powder when they're lifting weights, and that triggers their desire to use or uh, they use white shaving cream, and that triggers their desire to use. Or as I mentioned, they hear a song, uh, they smell a chemical smell, or uh, every time they're bored at work, they have the desire to use. Or whenever they have more than $50 in their pocket and they see cash, it stimulates the desire to use. The next point has to do with the downside of the cocaine high. It is so much more intense than a normal letdown or physical exhaustion that users come to fear the slide down. They want to keep going up. 
or I think Coke does this to just about everybody, is that you feel so good behind one snort, you want to feel 10 times better. And so we do 10 times, you know, 10 more lines until, you know, there isn't anything left. Another reason for compulsion is that some people learn that cocaine helps them deal with some of life's problems. And there's any kinds of problems, you know, um, had a bad day at work, so I'd go home and get loaded. My dad died, so I went home and I shot up. I mean, it makes a lot of sense, right? But over the course of time, um, cocaine becomes the answer to any problem one has in life. The final reason for compulsion has to do with heredity. That is, certain people's natural biochemical balance makes them react more intensely to a drug. They get more pleasure from it. The feelings are more intense. Everything is more than what others experience. Imagine a curve, which we'll call a compulsion curve. It compares sensitivity to a drug versus the compulsion to use the drug. The more sensitive we are, the stronger our compulsion is. When we're born, we inherit a natural sensitivity. Some are more sensitive than others. We increase our sensitivity, move up on the curve, if we use the drug. The more we use, the further along the curve we will progress, and the closer to compulsive use we will come. Those with low sensitivity can use more of the drug without coming too close to compulsive use. Those with extremely high sensitivity are already near the edge. They might use the drug just a few times and immediately begin compulsive use. We are all liable to compulsion, but some are more liable than others. This ultra-sensitivity has been defined as addictive disease. Out of every 100 people that are exposed to cocaine, about 30 to 40 percent will develop dysfunction at some time. Uh, and about 10 of that 100 will develop cocaine addiction but we are all liable to become sensitized to progress into compulsive use. We are all liable because drug use is not an either or situation. There are graduated levels of use. The divisions are experimental, social, habitual, abuse, addiction. We can progress from one level to another with ease. However, once we've progressed too far into abuse or addiction, the imprinting, the sensitization effect, makes it virtually impossible to go in the opposite direction, back to controlled use. Recovery is a, a process. It's not an event. Um, one of the big fallacies that people have is they'll go someplace, they'll either go an inpatient program, outpatient, or see a therapist, and that they're going to get better, and they don't have to think about it again. Um, recovery is something that a person works on throughout their life. One never recovers, you're always recovering. Though there are many models for recovery, most agree that because of the compulsive nature of cocaine, abstinence is the only sensible long-term solution. If you want to avoid relapsing into addiction, there are three main steps which can be used to achieve a drug-free philosophy. First is getting the drug out of the system. Our body chemistry has become so unbalanced that only abstinence will give it time to metabolize the drug and begin to normalize our neurotransmitter balance. It takes about a week to detoxify from the drug and perhaps another four weeks to three months till the body chemistry settles down. Next is building a support system that will give continuing advice, help and information when the user returns to his home and job and is subject to all the pressures and temptations that made him abuse the drug in the first place. I don't feel that it's my fault that I'm a cocaine addict. Um, I, I feel very strongly that it is my responsibility to pay attention to my recovery. Um, nobody can recover for me. Finally, and most important, it's restructuring our lives and finding things we enjoy doing that give us satisfaction, that give us the natural highs we came to seek through drugs. I tell people that if they can't find something that they like doing as well as they like doing cocaine, um, 
they will not have sobriety. They were not, will not have a quality life. Comfort for me now is that I feel productive and I enjoy my days and that I look forward to the things that I, that I like every day. Uh, work seems very acceptable to me now because I also get to be entertained every day. I've been working in the program that I'm in for the last two years, uh, uh, two and a half years without taking a salary. And so I think I get as much joy, inner joy, emotional joy, to see little kids' face light up to coming into new knowledge and new information. I think that has replaced, that has replaced that desire for that cocaine to give me that high. You know, I, I think that I, I, I often wonder if I didn't have that in my life, what I would be doing.